Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Roger Barker. I'm Director of Policy at the Institute of Directors. Um, the war in Ukraine is obviously a huge human tragedy um, now going on for over a month. And undoubtedly, there will be a huge impact on both the Ukrainian economy itself and the Russian economy. Um, but the topic of today's vidcast is to discuss what the implications of the war have been so far for the UK business and the UK economy. Is the, is the Ukrainian crisis going to put a stop to the recovery that we, we hoped was happening in the UK, uh, coming out of the latest uh, wave of Omicron and the pandemic? Um, or is this actually just going to be a blip on, on the trajectory of, of a strong business recovery? And more broadly speaking, does this crisis represent another nail in the coffin of globalization, a globalized business system? As Larry Fink has recently argued in his letter to CEOs published last week. Well, to discuss, to discuss these issues and others, I've got an excellent panel with me today. Um, and let me introduce them. Um, first of all, Ian Stewart, who is Chief Economist at Deloitte. Uh, good morning, Ian. Good morning. Um, and I'm also joined by Chris Forrest, who is head of SME Business Banking at Barclays. Hello, Chris. Good morning. Thanks for having me. And um, we also have our very own um, Kitty Usher, Chief Economist at the IOD. Hello, Kitty. Hello, Roger. Hello there. Um, well, Ian, I wonder if I could come to you for our first question, which is, what the immediate economic impact of the Ukraine conflict has been on the UK economy? Well, I mean, we've seen the impact immediately in financial markets, of course, um, in uh, rising commodity prices, um, quite a big sell-off in, in equity markets, um, businesses having to deal with uh, sanctions, uh, supply chain disruption, um, aspect of financial exposure, exposure of financial institutions to what's going on in Russia. And of course, this all massively overlaps with and complicates what was already the, the central problem for the Bank of England, which was how to deal with rising inflation. Um, and you know, putting this all together, um, I mean, what we've seen um, is a quite a, a marked downgrade to expectations for growth um, in the last five weeks and uh, sharply higher expectations of inflation, of course, not just here, but um, across um, the uh, the West. So, um, and underlying it, of course, is the fact that this is a new geopolitical risk um, which who, whose um, path is unforecastable. So, um, the uh, you, we have we have no idea how how this is going to play so it creates continued uncertainty which of course affects things like investment yes uh, kitty i wonder what you think the the perspective of our members is of, on this economic shock uh, well there's been a very a very broad uh, effect uh, with only 1 in 10 of institute of directors members uh, saying that the crisis hasn't uh, affected them uh, in in some way, so our membership is mainly uh, consists of you know ambitious small and medium sized companies, and the main effect for that part of the economy is in higher energy prices, where around seven in ten say that they're affected uh, by that. We've now got three times as many members saying that uh, energy, the cost of energy is having a negative effect on their organisation than we had uh, only uh, a year ago. Um, and then the, uh, uh, there's also uh, a sort of uh, effect from other global uh, commodities uh, that might be in the supply chains uh, of, our, of, of our members, particularly uh, the case probably uh, in the food sector, but it seems to be quite, quite widespread. But I think um, probably into the medium term, the biggest effect is actually on a lack of confidence uh, in the future prospects of, 
of the uh, economy. And we've seen in March uh, a, a, a dramatic collapse in business confidence uh, on the future of the macroeconomy. And we can now see in the data very clearly that that's reducing uh, planned investment, which, of course, then uh, makes the effect on the on, on the on the economy become almost self-fulfilling because, of course, GDP growth uh, relies on businesses uh, investing as, as well as consumers and government uh, spending. Uh, so uh, it's the it's the collapse in confidence, I think, due to the uncertainty that uh, Ian mentioned, that's beginning to have a, a measurable effect on on um, economic prospects. Yes. Um, Chris, I just want to come to you to speak about uh, what the impact specifically on business operations has been of, of the war in Ukraine. I mean, I have to say that the IOD took quite a principled stand at the beginning of this crisis. We actually called on British persons who were sitting on the boards of, of Russian companies to step down. We felt that was the right thing um, for them to do. But, I, but obviously, there's a lot of other things going on. Uh, what's been your perspective on that? Yeah, I think specifically, I think the sanctions have been, um, you know, it, it's caused that uncertainty, hasn't it? So um, we, we have a lot of businesses come to us and seek guidance on what they might mean or might not mean for their supply chains uh, and the like. So I think that clarity is really helpful for businesses um, in terms of what, what it might mean for them. I think in terms of SMEs, more generally, I think we're, we're seeing the lending um, appetite hold up, but it's more short term. So I think to Kitty's point, I think it's a more um, less less long term investment, more working capital, and how that how that would manifest itself. And it is, you know, that worry is coming through loud and clear from from our customers. Certainly, that um, energy energy related, you know, energy intense businesses um, are concerned about, um, and certainly the spring um, the spring measures the government announced you know, helps to some extent, but in no way are going to really um, uh, impact the the um, inflation growth. I think as well, something that's probably not said as much, but I'm hearing on the ground is it's the availability of supply. You know, so even if even if their supply chain is still robust uh, and, they've, you know, there is inflationary pressures, but I think there is... Um, you know, that worry that the supply chain might not be there and that larger companies might take that supply chain inevitably. So I think there's that going on as well. So I don't think we see, um, you know, uh, our kind of economists would say growth GDPs maybe dropped half a percent in their expectation. Inflation's probably gone up one and a half percent, maybe around there. But but I think it's more in SMEs. It's what's going on on the ground and that bump in the road over the next six months that might cause a worry that, you know, wasn't there before the war. Um, yes. I mean, I just would add to what you're, you're saying, Chris, that we did a survey of our members asking, should they stop doing business in, in Russia, for example, in response to the war? And 80 percent were very, very clear that 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 should happen. Um, however, it, it can be an issue in terms of extricating yourself, I think, from from the Russian economy. Um, there's no doubt that you could potentially face legal risk if you have contractual obligations with Russian companies and you decide you're going to pull out of them um, and they're not on the sanctions list, then you know it, the, there is potentially um, a risk there which the, which the UK government isn't, isn't protecting you from. Um, and certainly there's been quite a lot of controversy, hasn't there, with certain co companies, particularly French companies, um, haven't necessarily... Um, made major the moves perhaps that the public wanted in order to, to to move out of the the russian economy but i wonder do you, do you think that there will be reputational risks for companies that don't don't take that step yeah i think so but what i'm hearing more actually is um so i'll give you an example gasprom and other providers you know there's a bit of confusion out there as to what what companies can and can't do in the uk so i think that's inevitable and it's you know, it's, it's something we, we're talking to our clients a lot about giving that clarity, because I think most people want to do the right thing, don't they? And certainly want to comply with any rules that are out there, but they've got businesses to run and contracts to fulfill. So not, not always as easy as it first looks, I think. Yes. Um, I mean, just now starting to look forward, Ian, I wonder, do you think that there are now significant impl implications for 
well, for energy prices, for inflation, for interest rates going forward in, into the longer term from, from this crisis? Or is this just a relatively, you know, a short term supply sh- shock, so to speak? I, th- I think the timing's um, terribly important, Roger, because I think that you know th- one of the huge surprises um, from the pandemic was the the speed of the snapback in activity in labour markets um, and in, in inflation. I think, with hindsight, um, you know, we economists got it very badly wrong um, because we failed to anticipate how, when you almost shut down economies. Um, and then restart them when demand has been topped up through things like furlough and various forms of income support. You know, that that mismatch between supply and demand inevitably creates um, rising prices. And we've seen that on a big scale in the last um, 12 months. So the Ukraine crisis um, has exacerbated the supply chain and commodity shock at exactly the time when I think financial markets have been worried about whether central banks um, have taken their eye off inflation. And I think what's very significant is that since the Russian invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February, which is undoubtedly a a, a shock, negative shock to growth, um, the market expectations for interest rate rises have risen. So what it means is that financial markets think that this time, unlike the pandemic, unlike the financial crisis, this time central banks faced with a shock which will weaken growth are actually going to tighten um, monetary policy more. Um, And so I think we're in a world where interest rates are are going up. um, And I think in the UK and the US uh, rates by the end of this year could be around about 2%. um, you know, by long-term standards, vanishingly low, but by the standards of the last 12 years, really, really quite high. Um, and I think, although the prospect is still for um, growth for the rest of this year, um, the risks of recession have have increased. That confluence of um, very high commodity prices, um, tight labour markets and rising interest rates, those historically have been harbingers of recession. That's not the most likely outcome, but I think that is a, a, a risk. So, yeah, I, I think I think this is um, much more than a bump in the road, Roger. I think this is something which um, is, is, you know, massively complicates, you know, the, this central problem of economic management. Yes. Um- Kitty, I wonder, you know, a lot of our members may be looking at this situation um, with some trepidation um, and maybe saying to themselves, well, you know, government helped us get through the pandemic. You know, they cushioned the effects of this, this, this potentially uh, awful economic situation then. Why can't they cush- cushion us uh, through this particular crisis? Why can't they um, provide us with the same type, type of support? Uh, yes, I think there has been a, a, a change in the relationship between business and government. But of course, it's one that the government is very keen uh, to normalise. And I think if we've uh, heard anything from the mood music in, in the last couple of weeks, it's that the Chancellor is keeping open the option of intervening on the household side later in the year if um, energy prices continue to be so high that, that the cap uh uh, that households face in their utility bills uh, must rise again uh, in in October. Uh, but th- aside from uh, a sort of s- slightly more medium term policy uh, initiative on uh, the tax treatment of investment uh, and training, uh, there's been no guarantee whatsoever that uh, he will take extraordinary measures to support business when when energy costs rise. So there's a sort of there's a kind of re recalibration of expectations uh, going on deliberately from the government side there. But I, th- I think Ian put his um, sort of finger on a, on a really important point because you know it's 
crucial to uh, expectations of the future is what happens to consumer demand. And government will argue uh, that, that if households who do have some disposable income are still keen to spend, maybe they feel still a little bit flush from having saved from not commuting during the pandemic, for example, um, that they will continue uh, to spend. And so they will say that, that that will help business. And so it's right for government to intervene on the consumer side, not the business side, even though that's a very hard uh, message to hear. And that's probably implicit in the um, market expectations of interest rate rises as well, because, of course, the point of raising interest rates when inflation is high is actually to reduce demand. And if that happens anyway due to this shock, then interest rates uh, wouldn't be expected to rise so much. And the Bank of England is clearly trying to signal that that they are quite quite cautious on that. So I think the crucial question for the as, uh, the midpoint of 2022 is, is how do consumers respond to this? We know real incomes are going to fall, but are they still going to continue to spend? Because actually, fundamentally, they're really enjoying uh, the fact that the pandemic has ended more than they are worrying about the rising cost of living. Yes. Yes, Chris. No, do come well, in. I was going to say sorry to interrupt. Um, I think that's right. I don't, I don't like we don't you know, we're not um, predicting that we will inevitably move into a recession. I think the, um, the bit, there is still optimism out there. Um, I, I think, yes, it's tempered slightly, but I do still think there is optimism there. Businesses we're talking to every day are still looking for opportunities. They're trying to pass on the cost increases where they can. I think some of the, um, you know, the term breadbasket of the world coming out of Russia and Ukraine is, you know, so if you're in agriculture or, you know, it's wheat or or even some of the metals um, as well, that, that is painful. That's definitely painful. But I think the vast majority of businesses are able, are right now anyway, able to absorb the inflationary pressures and either pass it on or, or figure out ways to deal with it. And um, the, the message I would give is through the pandemic, you know, we did them. Um, uh, our, our learned uh, economists sometimes did uh, inevitably um, uh, strike a chord, chord of um, you know negativity, and you know, and quite rightly. But actually, most SMEs got through it. How sometimes I wonder. I'm you know in awe of that, and I think we all would be in awe of that. But they did, and so I think um, you know we're um, seeing businesses able to absorb all the government loan schemes. And continue, and even at interest rates at two percent, and Roger, I think that that sounds sensible. I, I do think that that still is um, absorbable, you know, in, right in in the current climate. But um, Chris, let me just let me just read you a, a, a short extract from Larry Fink's letter to CEOs. I just want to see what you make of it. Russia's aggression in Ukraine is going to prompt companies and governments worldwide to reevaluate their dependencies and reanalyze their manufacturing and assembly footprints, something that COVID had already spurred many to start doing. Now, do you, do you with your clients, especially in the SME sector, do you see evidence of that? Do you see evidence of onshoring taking place, of people looking for new and and shorter supply lines closer to home? So I, I see, I hear stories, but in terms of the data, overall, I don't see a market shift, I'll be honest with you. I think changing supply chains can take a long time and uh, the dislocation in that um, can be very painful. So I actually think our data would suggest that um, globalization will remain around the edges and maybe certain niche sectors, you will see localization. But I, I think overall, I don't, I, we're not seeing that at the moment, certainly. Right. Ian, I wonder, I mean, the counter argument to Larry Fink's view is that actually, you know, Russia is not, as far as the global economic system is concerned, Russia is not a particularly big player. I mean, yes, there is, it, it's important in energy and, as Chris said, in certain, the supply of certain minerals, for example. But um, ultimately, the big fault line in the global economy is between the US and China. Um, and that's what will determine the future of, uh, of globalization, not this particular conflict. One of, would would you agree with that? Yes, I, I mean, obviously, China is a 
um, a, you know, a, a preeminent economic um, power. Uh, Russia is a second tier power, um, somewhat smaller than Italy, about the same size as South Korea, um, albeit without the manufacturing presence of those economies. I, I mean, I, I don't think this is the end of globalization. Globalization is just too useful to us all um, to be to be ended. But I think it we, we, for several years, were in a very different phase of globalization, um, which is more contested, uh, where in parts it's being rolled back, and um, also where um, we're seeing the emergence of alternative systems. So by that, I mean alternatives to um, the uh, kind of almost the world economic order that was created after the Second World War by the United States and the and and its allies, um, and we see this, you know, for instance, in the SWIFT system. You know, we've all heard how uh, Russia, many Russian institutions, have been excluded from the um, SWIFT payment system. Well, Russia, um, China, the European Union have all been working on developing alternatives to SWIFT. And I think what we are going to see is the emergence of, of different networks. And I think we're in an age of uh, greater friction in globalization, which means that these connections will remain, but in some areas, um, they will um, be the, the costs associated with globalization will will go up, and you know Brexit's an an example of that. So I think it's a it, it's it's a far cry from the sort of might have been the heyday of globalization in the early part of of this century when it looked as though we were locked forever into a world of increasing liberalization and economic integration. Yes, and Chris, just at that point about payments, the payments problems during during this crisis. Um, I wonder if that that's been an issue for, for for your bank. There have been some some media stories about certain companies being unable, for example, to make bonds uh, coupon payment payments to certain investors because they are affected by by sanctions worries. Um, has that been an issue that you've been observing, for example? I haven't observed it in my part of the world, to be honest, mm. uh, not particularly. We've had a few issues um, individually with certain bonds and get, getting into markets. But I think generally, generally, um, the vast, vast majority of businesses have been very respectful of, you know, the humanitarian crisis and catastrophe in Ukraine and actually want to do everything they can to to make sure that they don't fall foul of that for the right reasons. So I, I don't, I think that's all I would say on that really. Yes. Uh, I mean, Kitty, do you think that um, that what's happening now might evoke a certain type of government policy response, you know, a type of policy response, which is more protectionist, which is all about kind of trying to promote self-sufficiency of, 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 the, of the UK um, or, or other economies, um, something, you know, which could could actually be a threat to, um, you know, the globalised trading regime and therefore bad for quite a few of, of the IOD's members? Well, I, I think there's several things going on here. I mean, obviously, this is a government that uh, was elected on a mandate to get Brexit done and to demonstrate the economic, the positive uh economic impact of Brexit. I suspect they're uh, looking, spending some time looking for that uh, at the moment. Um, and so you can see an argument that that onshoring might support that, at least in the short term, although economists would say if it's a less efficient outcome, it wouldn't make us more prosperous uh, in the longer term. I think there's probably a particular point about energy uh, self-sufficiency that's very much come to the fore. I mean, I can remember being uh, involved in government, you know, 20, 25 years ago at what was then the DTI when we were writing uh, energy uh, white papers. And you know, the sort of geopolitics of dependency on Russia was uh, part of the mix, but it didn't feel urgent, you know, perhaps in some ways because of the paradigm that you just uh, described earlier this century, you, you know, it perhaps felt a little overcautious. Um, but what we've now learned is that it can happen and it's real. Um, and so that will, uh, you know, attack a greater sort of risk risk rating uh, to, to, to that variable, um, which I think probably will and is prompting a deeper thinking about energy security within government. So I, I think at the moment that's probably uh, 
the main way it's manifesting itself. However, for individual firms, uh, I think it leads to, you know, if you're dependent um, on on imports, I, I think it will lead to precautionary uh, sort of hoarding to a greater extent in the short term, perhaps conservation of cash to give more options uh, if things go wrong as risk uh, increases. Um, but but overall, if you know if the if the P and L of your business thinks it's advantageous to uh, import, then ultimately that will prevail. Yes. I just wonder if I could turn finally to um, the impact of all of this on the green transition, you know, the, ra- the race to, to net zero. Um, and it seems to me that that there are some contradictory forces going on here. Um, on the one hand, you would imagine that very high energy prices would provide a real incentive for, for, the, for the green transition to take place. Um, on the other hand, you know, you hear talk of restarting um, oil production in the North Sea, or, or should we um, consider once again fracking, for example? That seems seems quite contradictory. Ian, I wonder uh, what you think um, the balance of these forces will be on on the green transition. Well, I, I, I suppose uh, we're, we're we're in a world where um, energy economists um, like to talk about the trilemma: the um, you know how how do you reconcile net zero energy security and and affordability? Um, as Kitty says, suddenly energy security has emerged in the way that it did in 1973 um, with the um, Yom Kippur War and the um, first Arab oil embargo, energy security has emerged as a huge issue. Um, I think that we're going to see a greater role for the government um, in energy policy. I think it's um, inevitable. Um, I I think also that um, it may be the case that a very long downtrend um, in the cost of energy for consumers um, is coming to an end. And I'm mean, actually just looking at the chart here, but I mean, back in the 1950s, um, about 5% of US consumer expenditure went on energy. Um, it's currently about 2.5%. There's been this long downtrend in energy costs. And I think that um, to ensure security and to achieve net zero, we may find um, that um, certainly for the foreseeable future, um, energy costs are are going to be um, higher. And I think you're also right, Roger, in saying that there are some real dilemmas here. You know, we, we, we reduce f- fuel duty um, in order to support um, uh, s- support households uh, in a way which you know clearly is not necessarily terribly good for carbon emissions. Um, if you ask most economists about this, of course, they say the ultimate solution is a carbon tax. You just put, you internalize the cost of pollution, um, uh, which is not captured fully by market prices, and you get behavior to to shift. I mean, that would be um, an elegant um, and, and um, with a carbon border tax, a, a very good solution, I think. Yes. And um, Chris, I wonder, have you observed this as being a fillip to to your clients' efforts to, uh, you know, green their energy sources or increase their energy efficiency? Is, is it is it a positive impetus or rather than having a more negative impact? I don't know if it's a positive or negative. I'm sure um, your members are, the, are just the same as, uh, you know, they do represent um, very well the SME community. And I think um, the conversation is moving much quickly to how do we do it? How do we get to net zero? What are our, how do we, how do we secure our energy supplies? You know, something that we would never have discussed particularly in the past, that step inevitably, um, you know, and even with the oil prices just coming back down a little bit, it's still there. It's a conversation that's not going away now. So I think um, the biggest question I get asked um, from companies right now is, like I hear the headline statements from government and I understand the need to do it. How do I do it with competing forces in my business? How do I, how can I get there? What, what incentivizes me to be there? Um, how can you as a bank support me getting there? All of those questions and they're, they're definitely coming to the top of the list um, of, of concerns for businesses. I'm yes. Sure you're finding that as well. Yes. Kitty, yes, and this is certainly something we're thinking about ourselves, isn't it? How can we help our members make make that green transition? 
Yes, I mean, we, we saw during COP26, which now feels like a, a different age, uh, that our uh, our members sort of uh, were very open to what they thought was doing the right thing in terms of the race to net zero. And they just weren't quite sure what they needed to do to to play their part and were sort of looking for government leadership in the way that Chris has just described to perhaps just signal a bit more about about what was required. Um, but so I think what's changed now is it's now become a very urgent business imperative uh, as well and perhaps something worth investing a little more thought uh, into um, but there's still a long way to go in policy terms to get the metrics right, uh, you know, to sort of embed carbon footprint measuring into routine business activity. We're still some way from that. And I think there's an information gap there at the moment. Well, um, Chris, Ian and Kitty, thank you so much for your time today um, and for discussing with us the impact of the Ukraine crisis on, on UK business. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.